Well, yes, most of you will be uh, familiar with Dr. Sarah Payne's story. Uh, sadly, she lost her daughter, Sarah, in 2000. Uh, Dr. Payne has been campaigning tirelessly for Sarah's law, which is the sex, Sexual Offenders Disclosure Scheme. That is in place, but still, uh, Dr. Sarah Payne continues uh, to campaign to be a voice uh, for victims and survivors and works very, very closely Working on updating with many right charities now. and updating, uh, indeed, that. Uh, that sex offenders scheme. Uh, but yes, please, again, please give a wonderful welcome, a warm welcome to you. As we saw, uh, you did take part in the true crime story on, on Channel 5, this is in 2017. How, how important would you say is it that victims are involved? It's not just about people here, TV, TV people. It has to be about the victims. It has to stop being about the criminal and it has to stop being about the effects of that crime. Because we can talk about sentencing, we can talk about all sorts of things, but actually nothing's ever going to give me back what I lost. And there is no answer to that. Um, so I can work within the system and I can, I can do all of those things, but actually until we understand the impact. I think we've spent many, many years of working out why people did things. I'd like to see a change in how we stop people doing things. You know, we, we've... I think everyone is an amateur psychologist these days, aren't they? We all sit in our armchairs and we kind of, you know, we know enough to diagnose certain things. But how do we turn that knowledge into preventative So, as I said, you took part in this in 2017, 17 years after Sarah's death. What, why did you want to, to take part in a true crime story? Um, I just think it's really, it's always been important for me to do these things and show people how people were so involved when Sarah went missing. And I am well aware that we drew people in and people suffered alongside of us, looking in their sheds and as they did and people writing to me. Um, and so I felt it was important to keep people updated that had supported the family back then and see that we are surviving. Not always very well, but we do survive. And that we are real. It isn't a, you know, it's not a Hollywood film. It's a real, real life. And your children uh, took part. We saw uh, some of them uh, in the documentary, including Charlotte, who's with us uh, this morning, joining, joining uh, her mother. She's your carer, also just your PA in, in your life, but why did your children take part and how did they find that? And again, I think that when it happened, and I think it's the same for anyone with crime stories, is pictures are taken and everyone stops in that moment. And so to many people, Charlotte is still four or five. Yeah. The boys are still young, very, very young teenagers. And they're not, they're, they are now the same age as I was when Sarah went missing. And when I you... I was just 31. So, so young. When, when you watched the documentary, you saw, you saw one of your sons crying and say things that you weren't even aware of. Uh, it just breaks my heart every time. Because, and I guess my job as a mum, and I've brought them up to be boys, and they don't show their emotions, and I hope that we're changing that as generations change, but it is really difficult when your children are breaking their heart like that. How did, how did you deal with everything? Just so much to deal with in terms <clears throat> of losing Sarah, dealing with that as a family. Did you, did, were you offered any help or support, such as therapy? Did you, did you take that out? I think every documentary that we've taken part of have always offered help. Um, <clears throat> some of it was phone counselling, and I think you know, face to face would always be better when it comes to trauma counselling. And some of the things that I've been thinking of re re more recently is, is the trauma counselling that you need, it's the dealing with the trauma and the shock, because that has physical and emotional effects later on. In terms of then the, the aftermath of being in that documentary, did you find it cathartic? Or any members of your family find it cathartic? I think that, I mean, when Sarah was taken, it was all about appeals, it was all about you know, appealing to the public, and so we were on camera, really, before we even realised there were cameras there, if you see what I mean. It wasn't too much later that 
you start sort of seeing it from a different angle. When you see yourself on TV, you start getting more critical at that time. You don't even think about how you look or what you say or anything else. You just do what you need to do. Later on, sort of 22 years later, I'm, I sort of look back and I think, I could have done my hair differently. It's <laughs> silly things, but they're real, you know, they're human behaviour. And this is actually what can get lost, even talking as, as a journalist and covering these, the human aspects of things. And, and in terms of taking part in the <coughs> documentary and, and when victims take part, just how important is that versus sometimes even not having victims take part in making the documentary at all? I think it has to be an individual choice. I know I've met many, many families over the years and some of them just don't want any part of the media or anything about it. Um, but for us, it was always, it was a journey and it was part of our journey. You know, and I was determined that Sarah wouldn't be a forgotten child. And we have achieved that. What do you think producers can learn and, and take away from when it, when it does come to, to producing true crime documentaries? Well, I think the last round of publicity I did for a book that I wrote was Letters to Sarah, and I asked for every interview not to mention his name. I just asked them not to mention him. And most journalists really struggled with that. But actually, as, as we got along, they, they quite liked the power of not mentioning him, of only mentioning Sarah. You know, I'm quite strict now about if I do um, paper media, I don't like to have Sarah's picture and his picture on the same page because it's just little things like that can, that can really trigger. And those are things that I guess all media can learn from from us, and they can't learn it from anyone else. They can only learn it from us. And, and saying that there have been changes in the approach of making true crime documentaries, uh, but do you still, do you have concerns maybe with how much, how much time is given to, to the perpetrators versus the victims? I think that one of the original things that really shocked me was that he was keeping a scrapbook of us, and so, that suddenly changed my mind about mentioning him. I don't want him to have that. It's not about him, it's about her. And, and actually, you are you're a fan of true crime documentaries. I am some a people be fan. Yeah, some people would be so surprised by that. Why? Why is that? I don't know. It's, just, it's always been a fascination of mine. Even when Sarah went missing, I was saying to the police things like, oh, don't you need this for forensics? Or, you know, that sort of thing. So I was kind of on a front foot with them. Yeah. Obviously, my version of it was Hollywood and everything comes back in five minutes and it's a phone call, you know. But given that, I was at least had some awareness of what was going on. You know, when I said to one of the policemen, so when do I stop being a suspect? And he was like, oh, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I know that's why you asked us to do the initial um, appeals, is so that you can watch. I know that's why police do that. You, you watch how the family reacts to see where your investigation's going. And they were quite shocked, I think, by that knowledge. Um, when they first started looking at him, I wanted to know exactly what his previous offences were, and they were all very much, we, we, can't, we can't do that, we can't tell you that. I'm like, if my daughter could or had to go through it, then I can at least hear it. You can't protect me anymore. There is no protecting me from anything bad now. So tell me the truth and let me deal with the truth. So interesting hearing you say this. And, you know, of course, all victims or survivors might have a different attitude, but there are some worried that true crime is being used for entertainment purposes. Would you say that's not the case, given, given you're a fan of them? No, I think it is, it is the case. Okay. But it's OK. But it's OK. Yeah, it's OK to learn and look at things in that way. And I think through entertainment we learn mm -hmm. so you know it has to be entertaining nobody wants to sit in front of a tv and not be entertained do they so you know you want to be engaged you want to know the people that you're looking at and i think that's why we have as a family sort of updated all the way along is that i want people to see that the children are surviving that you know, <coughs> Charlotte's beautiful and, you she know. is it's beautiful anyway, you saw a <laughs> she's here she's gorgeous uh, in terms of in terms of what you want to see producers doing? Where have they got things right? Where have they got things wrong? Um, I think for us, I mean, and I do understand that we've been quite unusual. We've built up such a good relationship with 
press media journalists that some of them are my very good friends and we text and call all of the time. Really? So, you know, that's because you guys are people too. <laughs> so does that mean that you're able to, you know, you know call them out or, or say, you didn't get this right, maybe if you do oh, I this, have this done way? Many, yeah. many occasions. But at the same time, there were times when things were so dark that journalists would come along and then maybe just take us out for lunch or do something, just make us smile or do something out of the ordinary. Um, I remember one time it was on the children's birthdays and so um, the News of the World team and I were under a death threats from paedophiles, sex offenders, and um, one of the guys on the team actually had to have an armed guard at all times, and I, I was just like, you keep that, you do not, I don't want the man anywhere near my children, I don't want anywhere near a gun of any kind. But that was a real threat, mm. and I had no idea that, you know, I mean, I was quite pleased that I was upsetting the sex offenders in that way, but on the other hand, there is another side to that, that they are dangerous people. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that we discovered was that my children became a prize. They became like an ultimate prize for that kind of person. So, you know, I could either try and protect them, and then but as they got older, they, uh, I've given them the tools to protect themselves, I think, or hope. And I said that you're, you're a fan of true crime documentaries, and you watch, it, watch them with, uh, with your daughter. Uh, yeah, she gets annoyed with me because I I, I, if we're watching a series, I'll go on ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Which so annoying. Apparently, is the ultimate bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> but you say this is what what makes you human, essentially. And people can forget that. Of course, mm. we love. We don't cry all the time. We're not living in constant shock. It's been 22 years, so there is a degree of time and you know, less harshness, less frightened, less scratchy anger. <laughs> And lastly, do you have any uh, a message at all for producers? There's quite a few here. Anything you want to tell them? Keep doing it. <laughs> Keep doing it. Keep telling our stories, really. Yeah. Not their stories. Tell our stories. And then maybe the justice system will catch up eventually. If we can change that tide, then that's what we need to do. It should be about the effects of a crime, not what a crime costs. I don't want to know what it costs to get someone into court. I don't care. Get them into court, get them into prison. The only safe place for a sex offender is a prison mm -hmm. because there are no children in prison. And that's the only time they'll ever be safe. Oh, Dr. Sarah, absolute pleasure talking to you. A real genuine Thank hero. You.